Hello, this is Casey Labs, and this is our fourth video on alternative energy, how to get power out of a resonance. We're going to talk about resonance itself here first. There's a couple things I need to describe. What you're looking at right now is a bowl full of water that's at resonance, and it's uh, being hit with uh, a certain frequency, and you can see how it's vibrating and how the standing waves. Anyway, we'll talk about more th about this later. I have here a board that has a description of a, re a spring resonance on it. And you can see the spring on the left. The uh, mass and spring I've got here on the left it can be vibrated and we're going to talk a little bit about springs because I have to talk about resonances in this particular video. A resonance is a system that is transferring energy from one portion of it to another and however you want to transfer that energy you end up with a resonance. Each resonance that's out there has got a frequency in this particular equation, you've got 2 pi f is equal to square root of k over m, uh, k sub 0 over m, and that is the description of the frequency of a resonance for a spring. As you can see, this particular, this particular spring that I've got here, it's got a couple different kinds of resonances on it. It's got a resonance that goes back and forth, as you would. It's also got a resonance that goes up and down. And there's also a resonance that's spinning around. So there's lots of different things going on in the real world when it comes to resonances. Now I also have a couple different types of resonance, resonances. And if you think hard, you can find a whole bunch of resonances that are out there. I've got this tuning fork. This tuning fork is actually a type of resonance. This particular tuning fork goes to about 100 hertz. And you can lead singing and get on key with this tuning fork because of its characteristics. I also have another type of a uh, spring here. This particular spring happens to be a 60 hertz resonant spring. And you can use this for scientific experiments uh, with plugging in power and various other things. But there's all kinds of different types of resonances out there. You find resonances that have to do with pipes. And on YouTube and various other places there's resonances that have to do with, oh I don't know, uh, you can find them with just about anything. It could be a speaker resonance, it could be a magnetic resonance, there's elect electrical resonances, electronic resonance, water pounding resonance. The list goes on and on. But in every resonance you've got there's a frequency. And uh, at any rate, you can find that frequency if you know what the equation is. Resonances are pretty powerful things and if you get something in resonance and it starts causing problems you can destroy a house, you can destroy a building, doesn't matter. Uh, resonances are very powerful. Another type of a term used in resonance theory is a th term called a cavity. A cavity is a resonance but generally it has to do with something that has an open top to associated with it. So this would be kind of like called a cavity only you'd call this more of a spring resonance than you would a cavity. Uh, if I had a bottle or a jar or something else here, I would call that a cavity. Uh, this bowl that I'm going to show you here in a minute, it's kind of got a kind of a cavity associated with it. And so when we use the term cavity, we're referring to a resonant system. And cavities, once again, you find whole bunches of them out there if you're looking for them. A thing that's not well known is at a steady state when a cavity or a resonance is triggered so this spring is triggered to go up and down. At a certain point it goes up and down and it starts coming back to the uh, even point. This is called a dampening effect. Now we end up with in describing dampening effect in resonances we use a thing called a Q. 
The Q in this particular case with the spring is equal to the square root of k sub 0 m divided by d. Square root of k sub 0 m is the energy inside the resonance and d is associated with the velocity of the force uh, and refers to the amount of drag. It's called a drag coefficient. But nevertheless, a Q happens to be the energy divided by the drag coefficient in all systems. And what I've got for you here is a chart. Let's see if I can get this chart here. Look a little bit closer. And you can kind of see how this chart looks. This chart is the e to the negative kt times the sine of omega t in this particular uh, formula. In this particular graph, the e to the negative kt goes down and keeps and determines the magnitude of the sine wave as you go down over the graph. Keep in mind that the sine, the omega, is what determines the distance between these signs. In addition, another point to remember about this is this particular graph does not have an ending. There is no, it does not get down to zero at this end over here. We're going to use this later on in our, um, in our realization of how to get uh, energy or power out of a, out of a resonance. You'll keep in mind that also every e to the negative kt has got a point at which the k is equal to 1 over t, giving you an e to the negative 1. And e to the negative 1 is about 0.35 or so, which happens to be about right here. So in every e to the negative kt type of graph, you have got a time point that determines the quality or the length of time that this particular E curve is going to take to go down to 0.35. Now, if you have a length of time that's real short, we say that's a damped type of an oscillation. That corresponds to a Q that's real low. In other words, D is real high or K sub 0 M is real small. We end up with a situation where these, the time constant ends up being real low, we've got a low Q. If we end up with a situation where the time constant is way out here, in other words, this thing just keeps going up and up and up, and up and finally gets down to 0.35 way out here, it's a relatively a much larger Q because its time constant is much longer, and then that would correspond to D being low. So this is the natural frequency, and this is how the natural frequencies work. Now, I need to bring us back here. When we're dealing with Q, Q also shows up when we're dealing with forced oscillations. In other words, we've been talking about the natural oscillation you put a you put a force on that spring it's going to oscillate back up and down and you can see that in this particular case the e curve takes a little while to get back to zero but it does because it loses energy in the spring and uh, air resistance a whole bunch of other reasons this thing will get back to uh, the zero point now we need to talk about forced oscillations. In other words, when I put an oscillation on this thing and I put on it like this and I just uh, keep it going at a certain point, well you can see that it's going to cause a lot of energy changes. In any case, what happens is you get at a forced oscillation at just the right frequency you end up with a magnitude on this e to the negative kt curve that doesn't change. It will not change, and uh, it doesn't take very much energy to put in there. If I go ahead and I uh, force an oscillation on this thing that's not in phase, not resonant, it won't do anything. And we're going to see this in a little bit with our bowl here. On the other hand, if I put it in resonance, you'll find out that it will stay up here. The magnitude will stay up here for as long as I apply my in phase force and resonance. Now, what happens is, not every oscillation, how, that you, excuse me, you have to ask yourself how 
precise is the oscillation. In other words, how uh, if you have a high Q, a high Q corresponds with a really sharp frequency response when it's being forced oscillation, when it has a forced oscillation associated with it. A low Q uh, gets you a low, free, a large frequency response. So you have a situation where you've got a, a graph that goes up, or you've got a graph that spikes. And we'll be seeing this here in just a minute with our bowl. In fact, I think we probably need to look at that now. I'll go ahead and start my bowl up here. Put the thing in resonance. There we go. Now, let's see what it looks like. This particular bowl is being fed by a battery and a 555 oscillator and an electromagnet. And then there's a little magnet on the bowl and so the bowl is moved at a certain frequency. Now, depending on how much water I have in the bowl, I can get that bowl to resonate at a given frequency. In this particular case, I have it resonating at its, at its frequency. Now, the way we handle this delta F, delta F is the distance between the half power points, and if you look up half power points on the internet, you'll find out that the delta F, if it's real small, you've got a real high Q. And if it's real large, you've got a real low Q. It's the same Q as the uh, original Q that we had for the uh, free, uh, free response. So when a cavity or a resonance has a high Q, it means it's got a very uh, sharp frequency response. And I'm going to show you this here in just a second. As you can see, this thing's got a bunch of standing waves on here. If you want to know what a standing wave is, there's a standing wave right there. There's all kinds of standing waves on here. They're actually waves the way the water uh, looks when it's being oscillated like this. It's called a standing wave. Now, I'm going to move this thing out of frequency. I'll move it up a little bit. I don't know if you can hear that or not. But there's nothing going on. So I bring it back down to being in resonance, and then I drop it down a little bit farther, and you can kind of see how the difference in the hertz, the hertz difference, the delta F, is really rather small when I have it in uh, close to resonance. So once I get the thing in resonance here, you can kind of see how it's banging, it's banging on the sides of the bowl. Uh, the amount of energy is real large and keep in mind whether I'm in resonance or not I'm putting the same amount of energy in this particular resonance as opposed to what's actually happening in the resonance so the same amount of energy is being put in here but at resonance it actually gives me a much stronger response than it would being out of resonance another little thing to note about this particular demonstration is that there are six little nodes one three four five six it's a hexagonal pattern all the way around and then there's anti nodes one two three all the way to six so you can set this up and do your own demonstration on it and see if you can figure out why in the world there are the nodes and uh, I think it would be an interesting uh, high school or college uh, demonstration to actually help you understand resonance remember as I move the frequency up or down determines the Q of the cavity. So what do we talk about today? We looked at a spring and how a spring actually uh, resonates. We looked at the equation for a spring. We looked at the equation for a Q. We talked a little bit about resonances and cavity. We talked a little bit about uh, uh, the free-floating Q uh, of a system and then we talked about the Q, the same Q associated with a forced oscillation and then I showed you a demonstration of how the frequency as you move the frequency up or down in a cavity or resonant system the Q comes into play as the half power points 
and you can tell the cue of the system by how close the half power points are. Um, if I have something really sharp to where I can't even do it, uh, move it with the rheostat, then I know I've got a really, really sharp cue. And if I've got a really, really sharp cue, I uh, have the capability of developing more power out from a resonant standpoint. So, unless there are any questions, this is Casey Labs signing out. Thank you very much for watching.